was one? Yes, there was one. There were... It, it's always been that 10%, though. Yeah. It hasn't changed. It's yeah. not like it's really going to that. Well, but now the, the newest congregation is the break-off right. congregation right. from right. the right. conservative but movements. But which, it maintains the same yeah. percent. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, um, I, don't, I don't know how the conservative movement is doing in other parts of the country, but it's definitely um, struggling. My third question, are there any new mosques uh, reflecting the... the uh, Absolutely. Not school funds, but I mean yes. masks. Yes, and schools, madrasas. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. I have to write it down. One of my questions. Yeah, one second. Hold on, just one second. Yeah, Canada and Shalom. Uh, Shalom and justice. You just answered one of the questions. I was wondering if children remain in the community. Uh, I want to ask you about, you mentioned the word benign when you talk about the Muslim community. Uh, it kind of lit a bulb went up in my head because I really had not considered the, um, how many towns in the United States might have uh, Muslim communities as such. And this is very interesting to me. And I thank you for whatever you say. You. Um, if they bring in speakers who are, as you said, toxic, this is uh, not completely benign. It may be that they don't start up other things, but this is just another aspect of, of their activity. And uh, one has to wonder if at one time or another this will not become more than just a benign community, a community that's quiet. Uh, you also said that they live in their own areas. In other words, they don't integrate. That's right. That's right. Um, actually, when Mark, Lan Mark Lance was in Memphis, I would say five or six years ago, so it was before the Muslim community grew as large as it did. And there were two or three activists, Muslim activists, on campus. And they are the ones who promoted bringing in speakers to the international program at the university. Um, and that's how he ended up coming. But um, for the most part, they... Um, Unlike in other places, for instance, Dearborn, Michigan, where in the public schools there's an effort to bring in halal meat, there's no such, that does not, that has, that has not yet occurred in Memphis. Um, if you ask um, people who uh, study and fear Islamic fundamentalism, somebody like Bridget Gabriel, about a community like Memphis, I'm sure she will say that there is a cell, a Hamas cell. I'm sure she will tell you that the textbooks are full of anti-Semitism. I don't read Arabic, and I don't know whether, I, I, can't, I can't validate this one way or the other. But she suggests that there are at least 60 cities around the United States that have Hamas cells, and she would she would definitely say in a city with 10,000 Muslims that there would be. What about the growth of the Muslim population? It's growing very rapidly. Yeah, I have a question about Aliyah from Memphis to Israel. Uh, what has it been for you years? And uh, how many Memphis well, are there? <laughs> how many Memphis are there in, uh, in Israel? They're probably, uh, you know, in my days, in I was there for nine years as Federation Director there from 75 to 84. And um, there was a significant number, I'd have to say, you know, anywhere from 30 to 50 people that were coming out at that time relative to Memphis. I don't think that that number really exists today, is my impression, that the, the cohort that I'm familiar with of Memphians living in Israel really go back to, I'm here 20, almost 23 years, go back to that, you know, 20 to 25 year period, by and large, not entirely. There, there's, the Fink family has recently come, etc. But um, it's, there's a tremendous amount of Israel activity, as Jerry has pointed out, but it, it hasn't resulted in... Uh, it's not a large phenomenon. Phenomenon. No, but that, that's what you see to some extent, um, you know, nefesh but nefesh notwithstanding, yeah. but that's what you see across the United States. Yeah. One more question. The, the question of the radical right, Martin Luther King was assassinated uh, recently. <coughs> in, in uh, How dare you? 
outside of Memphis. Yeah, Thank God. Speak about that. that uh, yes. In general. Yeah. It's it it it's a, it was a it was a rarity. It was a peculiarity. Uh, the Anti Defamation League was involved. Guangdong Judaic Studies was involved. The decision, a very conscious decision, was made not to give it any play whatsoever, and really, it got very little play. Thank, fortunately, and it was yeah. Um, I have to say that in the years that I've lived in Memphis, I have really not experienced any kind of anti. I, the, I sit in the CRC position. I hold that portfolio in our federation. And really, I'm very pleased to say that there is really almost, I, I don't know why, <laughs> you know, almost no anti-Semitism. The kinds of concerns that, we, that our, the Federation hears with regard to CRC, um, that one of these schools is doing a Christmas pageant and asking a child to participate and the parents don't want the kids singing Silent Night or uh, that a, a, an exam is being given um, on the eighth day of Sukkot, you know, Shmini uh, Atzeret or, or uh, you know, Sibchat Torah, and what can we do to change that? Um, really, those, those are the big concerns. Uh, I have uh, two <coughs> questions. One, the, uh, what is the origin of the Muslim community? Um, are they Pakistani Indians? Are they blacks? Are they no? They're all uh, Palestinians. Uh, oh. If you ask them, every single one of them will tell you they're Palestinian. Oh, you're not I'm absolutely. I am not exaggerating. When you encounter a Muslim in a store or you know any public situation, and you say, "Oh, really? Where are you from? Jerusalem?" Oh, well, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and, other... and and you know it. It's, it's a terrible, I have to, I'm, I'm going over, but I have to tell you that it's really a very, very difficult thing for someone who knows better, because invariably I'll say, oh, you're from Jerusalem, really, what street? <laughs> you know? Oh, well, I, my, my grandmother was from Jerusalem. I mean, really, what neighborhood? Well, my grandmother once visited Jerusalem. Oh, really, well, where are you from? Never been to Jerusalem. And that is, when it becomes dangerous is when they demonstrate or there's something going on in the news and the media comes and interviews, wants an, an interview with a rabbi and an interview with somebody from that community and right away, you know, my, my brother was killed by the Israelis in, in the West Bank and I am a Palestinian and I want to return to my homeland. Uh, my other question is, Memphis is totally unique of any city in the United States with its <coughs> uh, strong Orthodox community. Uh, there is no city in the United States <coughs> that has a, a small town. I know America somewhat. Um, and what is the reason, for, uh, uh, or how is it so that the Orthodox community has been able to maintain a strong uh, identity and hold on the, on the generations following? Because throughout the United States, whether you're talking about well, maybe Cleveland, or but say Detroit, or any of the other cities that are even larger than Memphis, the Orthodox communities have generally uh, coalesced into other larger communities, uh, like Erie no longer has an Orthodox community, that type of thing. So, what has made it that Memphis's Orthodox community has been able to maintain itself uh, uh, for uh, so long, and not only maintain itself but grow? Because Torah and Zion, and there are all kinds of programs. I mean, it's Memphis is known as a, as a city you can go to as, as a from Jew. Right. And you can spend Shabbos in Memphis, whereas you could not spend Shabbos in Chattanooga, let's say. I haven't been able to maintain a kosher restaurant. Right? That's true. Well, that's because food's... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cleveland is like that, too. Really. <laughs> um, first of all, I have to say, Baron Hirsch, which is the largest Baron Orthodox Hirsch, yeah. congregation yes. in Memphis, claims to be the single largest Orthodox congregation in the United States. So I, I don't know I don't know if you can prove that, but that that has been their claim. They still make their claim. Yes, it's obviously yes. Not true they do. Uh, <laughs> absolutely, yeah, proudly, and they'll stand by. Rabbi but um, the fact is that people maintain their affiliation, their formal membership, Jews paying affiliation in the Orthodox community without actually um, being observant in what you would define as an orthodox fashion. Um, many, as I said, you know, uh, 
somebody from Baron Hirsch will marry somebody from the Reformed Congregation, Temple Israel. They will choose to go to Temple Israel, raise their children in the Temple, and continue, but they'll maintain their membership in Baron Hirsch in honor, to honor their parents, uh, just uh, you know, for whatever reasons. But so, the three day schools. Yes. The, but the day schools now, the yeshiva is, um, is, has about 200 students going, and it goes from preschool through 12. Yes. Whereas there's a Solomon Schechter that has about 160 students um, going from kin from first grade to eight, and now the newest school is called Memphis Jewish High School, and that is trying that is an outreach to the non-Orthodox Jewish community that needs a an educational alternative because unfortunately the public school systems are terrible, mm -hmm. and um, so the, that would. But Does that explain why there's a conservative day school or a school, even though the conservative congregation is so small? Well, because this tracks not. Yes. Just because of yes. the public school Yes. Are bad. Because the <laughs> yeshiva, the um, Feinstein, it's uh, Marlon Hebrew Academy, Feinstein Yeshiva, the South, represents a very, very strong, um, very, 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 very solid Orthodox practice. And if you aren't Shomer Shabbat and very strict in your observance, you will not be comfortable there. The children aren't comfortable there. So yes, Schechter offers an alternative for the rest of the community. Before moving to the next uh, topic, you have two more questions. Justice Weiner and then after a question. There are, as I recall, four medium-sized cities in Tennessee. Knoxville, Nashville, Chattanooga, and Memphis. How do the other three, um, how, how successful are their synagogues? How long-lasting is their Jewish community? How do you com compare their uh, success or, or failure with the success of Memphis? Um, honestly, I know very little about Knoxville. It's very, very small. The University of Tennessee is there, so there's an effort to um, strengthen the Hillel there. Um, but. Um, it's, it's a very, very small congregation. Chattanooga is mostly reform. It's, um, an, old it's an old Jewish community. Um, very, very small also. I think 2,500 to 3,500 Jews. Nashville is the next, is, is the strongest. Memphis is the largest. Nashville being the capital of the state, um, they're, they, they're more active in terms of their community relations, and they do have a very strong federation. Um, and um, although it's a smaller Jewish community, it's a strong community. Um, I, I would, I, I don't know how, or, you know, if you, you know how you would feel about it, but I would say that the Nashville Jewish community, in its number, which is smaller, is every bit as strong as the Memphis Jewish community, but not as Orthodox. Memphis is unique in, in the Orthodox. They, have, they have one strong Orthodox synagogue. They don't have the day school infrastructure that Memphis does. It tends to be Nashville more cosmopolitan than Memphis as a whole, and because of uh, the music industry, the state capital, and Vanderbilt as a first class university. Memphis University is very good, but you know Vanderbilt is still Vanderbilt, and and um, that's the th that's the the overall uh, picture in, in in terms of Nashville. But it it doesn't have the infrastructure that, that Memphis mm -hmm. has. So. I'm uh, going to two small uh, questions. Uh, first one is, the United States tries to keep Muslims out, but not officially, but in fact, how come the uh, community grows so much? I have no idea. It, uh, you know, I seriously, I don't know. I don't know where they work. I don't know where they come from. But I just, we, this is a phenomenon that we have become aware of. Our federation works very closely, and this is kind of uh, off the record, we work very, very closely with the FBI. Um, a lot of communities are simply very concerned about their security. And so through the FBI, we've become aware of the incredible growth of the, of the community, but I don't, I have no explanation for it. And the second question is, when we speak of federation, we normally speak synagogue of federation. Now, what would be a synagogue of federation? Um, probably very close to the, very close to that number. Well, I was always told Baltimore is 55% that was 
as far as I have looked at. No, I, I think actually I think that Memphis, Memphis would exceed that. Manfred, when I was there, we did a population survey, and it was synagogue affiliation was 85%. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Synagogue yeah. affiliation was yeah. 85%. Because, uh, look, uh, at a given moment, these are fantastic figures. Yes, yeah. yeah. No, <laughs> no, I fully understand that. But look, we speak yeah. about it. 40% average uh, synagogue affiliation, and that's a much higher percentage at a certain moment in your life cycle, uh, which is part of their life are in synagogues, but these are enormous people. Yeah. It is, it is very unique, because I, I think, you know, when you talk about the life cycle, that um, young couples, before they have children, are the ones that are least likely to pay membership in the synagogue. However, because their parents, for the most part, live in Memphis, their parents will pay for them to belong to the synagogue. Okay, I know yeah. Yeah. Uh, Thomas, can I, can I take one minute on one other unique aspect? Yeah, I don't Jerry know. Did you, did you finish? No, I just want to say it, but then I'll... Okay, then uh, Jerry was excellent. I, I learned, too, because it's been a generation since I've been there. But one, one of the other unique aspects of Memphis is that if you look around Memphis, so to speak, um, in, in St. Louis, in New Orleans, in Louisville, there are Jewish hospitals. There's no Jewish hospital in Memphis. The, the major hospitals, other than the county hospital, are church-run, Baptist, Catholic, and Methodist. Our own, three of our four children were born Methodist, so to speak, in the Methodist hospital, and then we converted them. To the, um, and, and, but Jews always had the ability to practice in the Baptist hospital, not Methodist, but in the Baptist. So there was not a need to develop a Jewish hospital. The interesting, um, and Baptist was the largest private hospital in, in the United States, the interesting paradox is, however, that Baptist Hospital did not accept blacks for years, and it was a Jewish doctor from the north, uh, from Pennsylvania, who came into town, married a, Me a Memphis woman, and when he was setting up his, his waiting room, and they said, well, here are the plans and designs. Your waiting room for the whites is in the front, your waiting room for the blue. He was on staff at Baptist, where Jews could practice. They also practice now at Methodist, obviously. And, and he broke the color line. He had a, a black patient that he insisted they, you know, would be, um, not entry to the hospital, what's the word? Admitted, admitted to the hospital. Yeah, forget the English. Admitted to the hospital. They did not want to. They were trying to send the black patient over to uh, the county hospital, which is in, was inferior medicine, probably still is. And he insisted that his patient, if he's on staff, his patient be at Baptist. So, the paradox is that the Jews always accepted at Baptist, then turned around and broke the color line at the Baptist house. Thank you, Eric. Yes. I just, I just want to thank you. Uh, it's very, very enlightening. Uh, I hope this is the first of a number of community lectures which I think we should develop. We've never done that. We've never spoken about single town communities. I've spoken about to, uh, to the uh, Diagnostic Federation of uh, Stone Trend of Medicine and they go to the uh, You have been a pioneer. Thank you. And you've done that very, very well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.